So Paul, so now that we know that we can use the black body and these emission absorption line spectra to uh, just measure what things are made up of and their temperature, we clearly, well, someone, and somehow we needed to figure out where this came from, right? We need to figure out what the actual electrons and gases do, not in space, but what they actually do, and then apply it. Yeah, and the first breakthrough came from uh, Saha, um, a very famous Indian yep. astrophysicist, and he was able to work out that what you could do, if you could look at say the spectrum of the sun, yep. it would have, as you saw, absorption lines all over the place. And for example, you could look at the absorption lines of sodium when it's lost one electron, when it's lost two electrons, when it's lost three electrons, and compare the depths of those lines. And by looking at that, you can work out how hot the sodium is, what fraction of it's lost to different electrons. Okay, so really looking at those diff the different levels and the different quantities of transitions within each gas. You saw we have a lot of absorption lines to work on yep. and many ones coming to the same elements. And so he started working on the thermodynamics of trying to go from these lines to work backwards to work out exactly what state the gas is in. Yep. And this was uh, brought to a peak um, by Cecilia Payne-Gapochkin, or Cecilia Payne as she was at the time, yep. um, who in what was many people regard as the most brilliant PhD thesis on astronomy ever. Which pretty much changed the way we kind of did astronomy, to be honest. She was able to work, use Saha's equations and apply them to the sun and work out what the sun was made out so, of. So turn in the, essentially the mathematics and physics of what actually is happening in these elements to what would actually and is observable in, say, the sun. So she was studying the thermodynamics, the thermal physics of atoms being banged around at different temperatures and combining that with the quantum mechanics of radiation and stir in the spectrum of the sun. And out <laughs> came her PhD thesis. Yes, not a bad job. Um, <laughs> it's kind of interesting this came about from people at the margins of astronomy. I mean, someone yes. from India and a woman, one of the very, very first female PhDs in astronomy. Yes, that's right. Um, and what they discovered, though, is people prior to that had thought that maybe the sun was made of the same stuff as the Earth, only hotter. Yep. And in fact, the examiners on her thesis said, this can't be right, we know what the sun's made out of, but eventually people realized that she was actually spot on. And here we have what the sun is made out of. So there is a lot of stuff going on here. So this is all the different elements of the periodic table. So hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, I mean, you probably all memorized this at school. <laughs> right. We got some lead thrown in for, and mercury goat thrown in for a uh, good feature here. And you can see absorption lines from every one of these. Now, so this is in log, right? Log yeah. of abundance. So what that means is every time you got one here, it's actually 10 times more of the stuff. So kind of like earthquake magnitudes, right? It's 10 times bigger. Yeah. A five is 10 times bigger than six. So what you can see is hydrogen is the top, and it only looks a little bit bigger, but because this is a log scale, it actually means that 80% of the sun is hydrogen. So for instance, if we go hydrogen to oxygen, that's log four. So it's really four sets of 10 times. We're really talking about 10,000 times less oxygen than there is hydrogen. So if you plotted it fairly, it would be hydrogen, helium, and everything else along the bottom. We would never see essentially these at all. So we've, we've placed it at a scale which brings up the things at the bottom so we can actually see them. Okay. Because they're kind of important to us, us being mostly made out of some of these elements down here. <laughs> um, so by and large, the sun is 80% hydrogen and 20% helium. And so really... And about 1% everything else. Yeah, so, so by seeing the lines, and knowing what the transitions and how much energy is occurring from Saha and how often they occur, you can measure essentially the, the abundance, what the makeup of is of the sun. That's right, and in incredible, exquisite detail. People are still arguing about should this one be a bit higher or that one a bit lower. Um, but really, at the level we're talking about, it's almost inconsequential. Yep. So we already knew the sun was very big and low density, and now kind of, maybe we know why. It's very hot, it's made of hydrogen and helium, which are gases. So we saw earlier when we were talking, yeah, that the sun is less dense than the Earth, and we n know the Earth is not mostly hydrogen, so it should be denser than the sun. Mind you, it's still, I mean, normally we think of hydrogen as being very low density, but this is, the sun is denser than water, so the hydrogen must be very, very compressed, which yes. I guess I'd imagine what would be the case given how much weight there is to squish it down. Yep. This is highly compressed hydrogen in there. Okay. Um, and then helium, 20%. Mm -hmm. In fact, helium was discovered in the, by these spectral lines before it was discovered on Earth. It's why it's got the name helium from the sun god Helios. That's right. Um, and there, there's kind of this <clears throat> deficit almost of lithium, beryllium, and boron. And then we get the elements that life is made of, uh, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, which are quite high. There's a funny sort of odd even zigzag. Yeah, pattern. there really is. It's, it's kind of almost oscillating almost pretty evenly. And we'll come back to that when we talk about nuclear physics much more later. There's a peak around iron, this is called 
the iron peak, because yep. there's yeah, more iron than, for example, scandium and things, even though iron's got a heavier. But generally speaking, it's a decline as you go to heavier and heavier elements, so less and less of it. And then it kind of almost just plateaus away. Which is things like uh, these elements down here are much more expensive than these elements over here. And so that's because there's just less of them that are created. And in fact, this pattern is very similar to what you see in, for example, meteorites or okay. the Earth. So wait, so if you look at the, the kind of pattern and the composition, you get a similar ratio between Roughly. Them? So let's say you take the, uh, the average of rocks on the Earth's surface. Yep. I mean, you're not going to get the hydrogen and helium. Yep. In fact, the gases generally aren't there. They've escaped into space a long time ago. But all the heavier elements, so kind of if you did this yeah. sort of plot, it would show the same sort of sawtooth, the same sort of iron peak. So the, okay. Mm -hmm. And then this is the same me with meteorites and other planets even? Again, there are subtle differences, but by and large, we'll get ex the same sort of pattern, everything in our solar system, except that some things like the Sun have kept the hydrogen and helium, yep. whereas other ones have lost it. So it, that's obviously telling us a lot about where and how they were formed. That's right, and we'll come back much more about that when we talk about solar system formation. So, but clearly, there's a, it's a fascinating pattern that's got to be telling us an awful lot about the origin of the sun and the solar system. And I guess we could then apply the same technique now that we know it works and what it means for the sun to, say, other stars and other solar systems. That's right. And we can indeed observe other stars and measure the same sort of things. And by and large, you see roughly the same pattern. Other stars are also mostly made of hydrogen and helium, but they'll have different amounts of some of these other ones in complicated ways. Okay. And a lot of our colleagues up at Mount Stromlo Observatory spend most of their lives studying these sort of patterns. So we're now really getting somewhere with the sun. We not only really know how far away it is, yep. we know how big it is, we know how hot it is, and we know what it's made out of, or at least what the surface levels are made out of. I mean, that, that's pretty big progress given that, you know, for a large chunk of time, we didn't really know how big, if it was how much further or how much harder, or even if it was different than the Earth. And we've learned some really important techniques. We've learned how to measure distances, yep. we've learned how to measure masses, and we've learned how to use spectrum. We've seen incredibly useful spectra are because they tell us the temperature and this exquisite detail of chemical composition. And it really all is about, we can't just use just one color of light. We need to use lots of different colors of light in lots of different ways to really put this complete picture together. And we can't just look at, oh, that's a yellow color because that doesn't pick up enough detail of all these emission and absorption lines. That's right. I mean, uh, you saw there are thousands of emission lines in the region the human eye perceives as red. Yep. And the eye can't tell one from another. And we can't even look at just yellow because we may be missing all that energy or light in the blue colors, for instance. Yep. So, but if you have spectra, you can measure gravity, we can start learning a lot of thought. So now we've kind of, we've got as, about as far as we're going to get with just observation. We now know what the sun's made of, its density, yep. its mass, its radius. So as we go forward, we're going to have to actually figure out what powers it, and that's going to be a lot more theoretical. We're going to have to study the theory of nuclear power. Sounds good.